Oi, pessoal, sou a Vitória, sou orientadora do Education USA PUC Rio. Para quem não sabe, o Education USA é a fonte oficial sobre educação nos Estados Unidos. É, a gente oferece orientações e webinars é, gratuitos com universidades americanas. É, então, vocês podem entrar lá no nosso site, educationusa.org.br, conferirem nossa agenda completa. A gente tem plantões Education USA para vocês tirarem suas dúvidas. E hoje a gente está com a Binghamton University e a Tânia é a representante da instituição. Vocês vão saber mais sobre bolsas de estudos, sobre o Common App e sobre a própria universidade. Um, thank you so much, Tânia, for um, being here to talk to us about these topics and about your institution. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as Victoria said, my name is Tanya Barajas. I'm one of the admissions counselors here at Binghamton University. Um, so initially, uh, when we were thinking of a presentation, uh, we were thinking of how to apply to merit-based scholarships. But I said, you know, actually, Binghamton, you can't apply to merit-based scholarships. We don't have an application process. Um, so that's why for this presentation, we're doing using the common application and understanding merit-based scholarships because the common application is going to serve a dual purpose, both for admission and for, uh, for determining merit scholarship. Um, and that's how our university is structured, is how a lot of other colleges and universities are structured. So hopefully you will find this um, helpful. And if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat box. Um, we may get to them during the presentation or towards the end. Okay, so first, you know, what are merit scholarships? Uh, so sometimes merit scholarships are based on uh, your athletic merits or your talent, uh, but most of the time when colleges and universities are talking about merit-based scholarships, they're talking about scholarships that are based on your academic performance. Uh, so how, you, how you've done in your high school, um, for those students who might be transfer students, if you're already going to university and you're thinking about transferring to, to a college or, or university in the US, um, that might include your performance in your university and your performance in um, high school and uh, possibly test scores, you know, some, uh, colleges and universities do require standardized test scores to determine merit scholarship. Okay, so this is a phrase that we use frequently uh, because we do get that question, how do I apply to merit scholarships? What we tell students at Binghamton is there is not a separate scholarship application. Students are automatically considered for scholarship when they apply. Um, so it's important to, to understand this phrase that when we say students are automatically considered for scholarship uh, when they apply, it's not that they will automatically get a scholarship, but that we are using the materials that they send us. So the common application, parts of the common application, uh, in particular, uh, their transcripts, their letter of rec, we're using all of these materials that they send us when they apply, both for consideration for admission to the university and for consideration of scholarships. Um, students, it's more, it's very common that, you know, students may receive an offer of admission, but merit scholarships are quite, can be quite competitive. And so not every student who receives an offer of admission will also receive a merit scholarship. Um, so the hope is by thinking about these different parts of the common application, being very thoughtful about them, that this will enhance your application overall, both for admission and for merit scholarship. Uh, so what is the common application? Uh, so the common application is used by uh, over 800 different institutions in the US and around the world. It's common app is its own company. Um, so you can go onto the common app website, you can create a profile and you can select uh, several colleges and universities that you would like your common application to go to. Uh, so this is great because many, many years ago, it used to be that you would have to make a separate application for every single college or university that you're applying to. So what Common App has done and other applications like it is they make it so you have to 
Uh, so you don't have to submit so many different uh, applications. So that said, keep in mind that when you are filling out the common application, that this is going to be seen and used um, by more than one university. So you want to keep it kind of general. Um, you don't have to use the name Binghamton University in your essay or in particular areas. Um, you can keep it quite general. All right, so the most important part, especially for determining merit scholarship, is going to be the transcript. Um, so we are uh, university, Binghamton University, as well as other colleges and universities, they're going to want to see a copy of your school's transcript, either your school officer, a high school counselor, a guidance counselor will send it by postal mail. So send a hard copy of, of that to the university or by email. And I think that's becoming more and more common. Uh, schools are accepting transcripts by email. Uh, Binghamton University also accepts transcripts by email. But there is a section on the common application. It's under the uh, education section where you can self-report scores. So it is most common that what students will do is that they'll report the, the classes that they are currently in. So if, they're, if you're in your final year, they will report the classes that they are currently in. Um, it, depending on what time of the year they are applying, maybe they've already completed half of their school year, they can also self-report um, their mid-year grades. And that's helpful for, for the reader or for the committee that is reading your application uh, to see the current classes that you're in. Uh, overall, we want to see uh, that you are challenging yourself in your curriculum and we wanna see how you did over time. Uh, so we're not just looking at your final year or your penultimate year, uh, we are looking at all years. Uh, so here's an example of a high school transcript. We see the first year, second year, and third year for this student. We see all the courses that they took. We see the progress. Um, the student had arts in their first year, but they didn't continue with it. That's okay. Um, we see how they did in biology. It looks like they got better over time. And so maybe that student is still in biology in their final year. So if they're self-reporting scores, you know that's nice, helpful to see that they're on an upward trend, right? Um, so we are looking for trends and, um, and that's something that, that a lot of counselors are doing. Very important in your transcripts. All right, extracurricular activities. Uh, this is also a section on your common application. A lot of students will ask, you know, how important are my extracurricular activities in determining merit scholarships? Well, it, every college and university is different. They're recruiting for different things. They have different programs. Um, so it is helpful. What I would say, the, the more you can share, the better. Uh, so what is considered an extracurricular activity? Uh, sports are considered uh, extracurricular activities of sports and clubs and organizations. Um, so you can put those down. We don't need to see a hundred different sports and organizations. We just need to see the ones that were most meaningful for you. Um, also, if you're doing work or internships outside of the house, or maybe if you are uh, taking care of younger siblings or taking care of grandparents or doing things within the house, how you spend your time. Um, so you also want to be thoughtful about how you write down what you are doing in your extracurricular activities. So let's take, for example, this top picture on the left with the students uh, playing rugby, right? You could write in your, app, in your extracurricular section of your common application, uh, rugby co-captain, two years. And that's okay, but it's kind of a missed opportunity because you spent two years playing rugby, so we want to hear just a little bit more. Maybe you could say rugby co-captain, two years, helped team get to a championship in, in final year. Uh, so that tells us a little bit more about the impact of your involvement in that sport, or maybe, you know, that sport's impact on you, you know, helped to 
increase your grades by being a part of a team, having that support. Uh, same goes with clubs and organizations. You know, we have students who are, they write club president and then they don't write anything else. Um, but if you're a club president, maybe you could write one sentence just to say, uh, you know, president of environmental club uh, started a recycling initiative on campus. We recycled over um, 1,000 sheets of paper or something, something along those lines. One, one or two sentences that show that impact. The same is true with things like work and internships. Um, sometimes students, they just put that they worked 20 hours a week as a waitress and that's it. But, you know, maybe they have some achievements in that job that they would like to share. Maybe they've learned quite a lot. Maybe uh, the money that they're earning from that job is going to help support family. So just adding an extra sentence, an extra few words um, could be helpful there. And then also, speaking of family, taking care of your younger siblings, taking care of grandparents. There are times when I have conversations with students and I say, well, what kind of activities are you involved in in school? And they say, I can't, I'm not involved in anything. I don't do anything. I don't do anything. What do you mean you don't do anything? They're like, I have to take care of family. Well, that is still something. So you should definitely count that as part of your activities, think extracurricular activities. Um, you know, if you're watching your younger sister for how many hours a week are you watching them? Do you help them with their homework? Um, you know, these are great things to, to add to let us know uh, that could be helpful with merit but scholarship or with other programs. Uh, so for example, a lot of colleges and universities have special programs that they are recruiting for as well. Um, Binghamton has a couple first year undergraduate research programs and I have seen on student uh, applications where they write, I'm, I was in this club and I'm in, as part of my club, we did research in uh, aquatics and we did, and I'm really interested in, in doing uh, research. So I say, oh wow, this student has research experience in the sciences and it sounds like it's something they really wanna do. So I would recommend that student for that program. Um, so that's why it's important for you to share as much as you can and be really thoughtful um, in all of these areas. Okay, so with regard to test scores, um, the common application does have an area on it for you to self-report scores. Um, though you do have to check with each college and university that you're applying to, uh, some colleges, they always need your test scores. Others might be more flexible or might be more test optional. Uh, so you do have to check with the testing policy uh, for each campus that you are planning to apply to. Uh, what I most often see on applications, the common application, is that a student will self may self-report their test score, but they also let us know if they're taking score uh, test in the future. Uh, so there are times where we might wait or we might reach out to that student to say, hey, it looks like you we're gonna take this test again in the future. Um, would you like us to wait for that score or would you like us to go ahead with the information that we have now? Uh, so that's something that we've done occasionally with students. Um, with regard to being um, SAT or ACT test optional, you do have to uh, reach out to the campus to say, am I still eligible for merit scholarships if I don't submit the SAT or the ACT. Uh, so with Binghamton University, the answer is yes, you are still eligible for merit scholarships, even if you don't submit the SAT or the ACT. The other question that comes up a lot too is, you know, will I have a better chance of getting a, a merit scholarship if I do submit the SAT or the ACT? And you have to be careful here because it, it, it depends. Um, you're not automatically given an, an advantage just because you have a test score. Um, it has to be a good score. Uh, so you do want to check with each college and university to see about their histories. You, know, you can ask about students who had been admitted in the prior year, you know, what were their average scores, and if you feel like your test score is or will be matching with that average or maybe even uh, surpassing that average, then that's considered competitive for that school and it may 
enhance your application and your chances of getting a merit scholarship to submit the score. Um, but in these times with, with COVID, a lot more colleges and universities are going test optional and they're trying to be quite uh, inclusive of students because we've had students who, you know, they cannot, they cannot get a date to go to a testing center. Testing centers are closed. Um, and, or if they did get a date, though, that might be canceled. Um, so we don't want to put you in a position where you're going to be in danger or um, overly frustrated because you have to have the score. Again, optional means optional. Uh, you can just check with the colleges or universities to see if they, if you, if you are still eligible for merit scholarship, um, if you do not submit that SAT or ACT. So that's a, because ne after transcripts, uh, test scores are going to be the next part that help to determine merit scholarship. All right, academic honors and achievements. So there is a place on the common application for you to list uh, your certificates, your awards, um, things that you're super proud of. Are you a student who has a perfect attendance in school? Um, did you, you know, win an award in your classroom or uh, within your grade? Uh, did you do a fundraising project for your class that you're really proud of? Um, you know, this is a great time for you to brag, to show off those achievements, and it's okay. You don't have to be humble. It's just telling the truth if you, you know, won these awards. Uh, and you can also put here any achievements that you've earned outside of school. Maybe you entered a citywide science fair and you earned an award there. Also, it doesn't have to be first place. It could be second place, third place. If it's something that you're proud of, feel free to share that information. Uh, this is a good place to put it. All right. With the essay, there is uh, an essay part of the common application. Um, the common application has about six or seven essay prompts that you can choose from. And you just have to choose one. Uh, it's about 500 to 650 words. Some colleges and universities also require a supplemental essay on top of the common application essay. So check with the campuses that you are applying to. Binghamton, we only require uh, one of the common application essay prompts. So this first one, which I gave you a little sneak peek uh, to, is about identity and background. And these are publicly available. You can go on to the Common Application website to see these essay prompts and to work on them. Um, some students have an, a background, identity, interest, or talent so meaningful they believe their application would be incomplete without it. If this sounds like you, please share your story. The next one is overcoming obstacles. Uh, so. The lesson we take from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. Recount a time when you faced a challenge, setback, or failure. How did it affect you? And what did you learn from the experience? Third, challenging a belief or idea. Reflect on a time when you questioned or challenged a belief or idea. What prompted your thinking? What was the outcome? Four, describe a problem you solved or a problem you'd like to solve. It can be an intellectual challenge, a research query, an ethical dilemma, anything of personal importance, no matter the scale. Explain its significance to you and what steps you took or could be taken to identify a solution. Okay. Uh, discuss an accomplishment, event, or realization that sparked a period of personal growth and new understanding of yourself or others. Describe a topic, idea, or concept you find so engaging it makes you lose all track of time. Uh, why does it captivate you? What do you do? Uh, what or who do you turn it to when you want to learn more? And then lastly is a topic of your choice. So if none of the prior topics are interesting to you, you can also do um, a topic uh, of your choice as well. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I think one of the big myths about the essay is that uh, the essay 
you know, is designed to impress the committee and students should have this amazing personal story. Um, and that's not true. Really, uh, the purpose of the essay is, is just to get to know you better, to learn things about you that we wouldn't otherwise know just from looking at your grades or just from looking at your scores. Um, you know, it doesn't, we like to see good grammar and good spelling, but it's the content is the most important thing. This is a story about you. So, you know, if you were to drop it on the floor and somebody that you know, a family member, a friend were to walk by and pick it up, they would read it and they would know, ah, that this belongs to you because it has your voice, it has your story, it is uh, unique to you. Uh, so again, about 500 to 65 words and my best advice would be to get feedback. So I know some of these stories can be kind of personal, um, but find somebody you trust, whether that's a teacher or another uh, uh, adult, somebody who's a very good writer and have them read it, do edits and um, just let us know. Okay, uh, another part of the common application is the letter of recommendation. Um, so this is going to come from a teacher or a guidance counselor uh, when you're doing the common application, you're going to put in your teacher or your guiding, guidance counselor's email address. And then that person will get a unique link for them to upload your uh, letter of recommendation. So they should know you. They should know your work. They should know your potential. They should know your character. Um, they should be able to speak to your potential to succeed in a university setting. Um, so if you are in your final year of high school, think about you know which teachers you have a good uh, relationship with uh, which teachers you have had good work with um, and if you're in your uh, second year first year of school this is a good time to think about building relationships with teachers because these are the folks that you're going to reach out to for a letter of recommendation later on every school is different uh, Binghamton only requires one letter of recommendation but other Colleges and universities may, may require two or more. Um, and they may require a letter from a specific teacher, like a math teacher or, or uh, a science teacher. Um, so make sure you check to see what those requirements are. And finally, additional information. Um, so the additional information section of the common application. Um, this is where you can explain any anomalies or anything else that you uh, would like us to know that would help us read your application uh, better. Um, so for example, if you have a physical or a learning disability, um, you know, letting us know that in spite of this physical disability or learning disability, you were able to come through or, um, you know, let us know this is the place where you can t let us know about any red flags. There are times where I'll be looking at a student's transcript and I see that they're doing okay in their first year and then in their second year, there's a big dip in grades. And uh, in their third year, you see it, it starts to come back up again um, and they don't talk about it anywhere else in the application and I don't hear about it in their letter of recommendation. Um, so that's kind of a, like a red flag because you, there's no information about what happened that year. Um, so let us know if, if something happened that year that affected your uh, grades. The additional information pages or section is a good place to, to let us know. Um, also, you are not required to fill in this area. Don't feel like you have to take up space. If you feel like everything in, in that application is there, um, that's okay. You can leave it blank too. Um, this is not a space to use for a resume. It's not a space to use for another personal statement. Um, and you know, don't use the space to repeat things that you've already shared with us already. Again, this is just a space for you to uh, let us know things that we don't already know that would help us to read your application better. Um, other examples are if your school has an interesting grading system that is atypical for your school, or if your school um, has like a di different online class. Uh, something that's also new for this year, I believe, is that Common Application is going to put a space for you uh, for COVID. So if COVID has affected you in any way, um, that's where you can put information there. 
um, you know, for, for any disruptions that you've had in your education or, or just in life in general, because it's not just about academics, uh, your, it's not just about school that affects your education, but things that are going on around you, of course, can affect your academics. So uh, the more that you share, the better. It's, overall, that's the, the reigning question, the reigning theme is that the more that you share, the better. Okay, so this is a good time um, to ask any questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing to see if we have any student questions. Um, is there a specific part of the application that counts the most for you? Um, so the grades, so for especially for determining merit, merit scholarships, it's going to be your school grades. Uh, so Binghamton, uh, as Binghamton University uh, was a, a university that required SAT or ACT um, for many years, and then we, this is kind of our first year of going test optional. But even when it was required, uh, we were still primarily looking at your school grades. So if it's your first year, um, you know, try to do as, as best as you can. Um, also, try to challenge yourself. You know, it doesn't matter if you're in a national curriculum, if you're in an AP uh, curriculum, an, an international baccalaureate curriculum, if you're in a dual curriculum. Whatever curriculum you're in, we just want to see that you're doing well and that you're challenging yourself uh, within that curriculum. Great. Let's see, have you seen an essay about faith? How the university sees the essays about faith? Um, yeah, I've seen uh, essays uh, about faith. And it's, it's fine. It's not a taboo topic. You can definitely talk about it. And there's so many different ways to talk about uh, faith. So you, if you feel like, you know, that's something that you want to share, I think faith would fall under any one of those topics. It could fall under identity. You know, people feel they have an identity that they align with very strongly. It could fall under uh, a certain challenging a particular belief. We have students who have written about struggling with their faith. Um, so it really just depends on how you want to frame it. It's going to be unique to who you are. So um, that will be fine. Again, with the essay at the end of the day, uh, we're just trying to learn a little bit more about you that we wouldn't otherwise know from grades or from, um, from the essays or for, from grades or from the uh, scores. Um, and you know, we want it to be from your, from your perspective, from your voice. Okay, how important do you think uh, it's the new COVID essay on the Common App. Um, how do you think students can use it? The new COVID essay on the Common App. The, well, the section for COVID-19 where students can write what's, how COVID has affected them in any way. Um, it is pretty important because every student is, is unique. So for example, within your school, your school may have gone remote, so they're doing distance learning. They may have done some classes pass, no pass. You know, so that's something that's at the school level. But personally, not every student has access to the same resources all the time. Um, we have students who, you know, they're learning from home. Home is a very different environment from school. Um, they may be sharing a computer with brothers and sisters and siblings. So that's that's, a, that's the effect of COVID when you're living at home. And so that's difficult to do. So that's something you want us to know because we, we're not gonna know it. Unless you tell us, we're not gonna know. Um, so you could say, you know, even though um, we're sharing this one computer, you know, we're, we made a schedule, we're still making it work. And I was still managed to get these good grades. You know, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent to know. Um, other things are, um, maybe just even internet access in general. You know, we have students who, they may go to the same school, live in the same neighborhood, but they have different internet access. Uh, and that's a result of COVID. And of course, there's those stories of, you know, family members, friends, people who've been, or even students themselves who've been personally affected if they've con contracted COVID. Um, so yes, again, it's okay to overshare. <laughs> you, you know, even if you're you're not sure, um, 
because we want to, to look at you as, as the full student, not just the numbers, not just the numbers of your grades, not just the numbers um, of, your, of your scores. And, and so that's why, that's what makes uh, scholarship determination so difficult is because we are looking at all these different pieces. But as I had mentioned before, uh, still the most important piece is going to be your school grades. Um, we want to make sure that you're, you're doing well in school um, and if you're, you, and if you have been affected by COVID and you're still doing well, or if you've only gone down a little bit, you know, we want to make sure that you're recognized for that as well. All right. Next. Uh, how many do you think students can use, how uh, many, many Brazilian students are unable to take the SAT due to the pandemic? Will that be considered? when you analyze their applications. Um, yes, so you know we do try to do our own research, of course, but if you want to say like there are no test centers in Brazil, that's, you know, then there are no test centers in Brazil. <laughs> we can't require you to send an SAT or ACT if there's no test centers in Brazil. And we're not gonna make you get on a plane and go to some other country to take a test. Um, that's, that's not right. Um, so yeah, we absolutely, that's why it's optional. So you can say, no, I'm not taking the SAT or the ACT. I don't have a score. I'm not going to submit a score. There's no test centers in Brazil. Uh, and this is what I have. And you will still be eligible for merit scholarship consideration at Binghamton. But it's a good question to ask. And it's a good thing to let, let readers know, let readers know. I have heard that the state universities are not used to giving scholarships to international students and that some just don't offer it. Is that true? That is true. Um, so a lot of uh, public institutions and state schools, um, you know, they, they're, the, the difference between a public institution and a private institution is funding. So public institutions are funded by the federal government, US federal government and by the state government um, and they subsidize um, education with, uh, for uh, citizen students with tax dollars. So that's why uh, there's not a lot of scholarship that's available for international students, whereas private uh, institutions have endowments so they can, and they're private, so they can kind of do what they want. So typically a private institution will charge the same uh, tuition for all students, regardless of uh, if they're in-state, out-of-state or international whereas a public institution might have a varying uh, uh, tuition charges for in-state, out-of-state, and international. Um, that said, though, in general, private institutions tend to be more expensive overall for, for all students because they're not receiving those uh, federal and state government subsidies. Um, so our, our institution is a public institution but it is also one that offers partial merit-based scholarships to international students. So you just have to check, you have to check with the institution. Um, is it true that if I have to, is it true that if I want to have full scholarship, the admission officer have to like me so much to offer me? Can you talk about, um, it's not about liking, liking the student or disliking the student. Uh, so again, with merit scholarships, it's really based off of your, your grades. Other things we look at, um, we look at the, your performance with the total pool of applicants. So, so we're generally offering scholarships to the, the top performers for that year. And that's what Binghamton does. Some schools, they have a minimum grade that they require, they'll say, if you meet this minimum grade, then you'll be guaranteed the scholarship amount. So each college and university is a little bit different. With Binghamton, um, we don't have a minimum grade that will equal a, a particular scholarship amount. We're evaluating students in a, a pool of applicants and we're offering scholarships to the strongest students um, in the pool. And so we look at your grades, but we also look at your curriculum. We look at your performance over time. Um, and, you know, for, Sometimes students will submit, you know, uh, scores for their, like national scores um, for their country for consideration. So, so sometimes we'll look at that, it just kind of depends on, on where they're applying uh, from. Um, so it's not about liking 
the student, we love you all. We love all of our students who apply to us. Um, the other thing too, and I, what this reminds me is, is sometimes students will write essays about, um, you know, somebody died in my family or, um, you know, I, I uh, so there was a divorce in my family. We also um, don't offer award funds because we feel bad <laughs> either. We still, we need you to be a good student. Now it's very different if you said, you know, we experienced this loss, but we were able to persist and, and still have, you know, these good grades. That's a different kind of story, but you're not going to get any funding from colleges or universities because they, they feel bad, especially when it's a merit scholarship. Um, there, most important question. And then full scholarships, um, you just have to check with the college or university. Um, our, our university does not give full scholarships to any students, not even US students. Um, so, you know, some do, some do, some colleges and universities do. So it's a good question to ask. Um, so just to review some of those questions, good questions to ask other colleges and universities, you can ask um, if they, you can ask if they have a scholarship application or not, you know, and then you'll, you might hear that phrase that we heard earlier. Um, nope, you, you might hear, uh, there is no separate application, you're automatically considered when you apply. Uh, so the next good question is to ask, will I still be considered for a merit scholarship if I don't submit the SAT or ACT? They may say, um, yes or no. And then there's always going to be a step-by-step -step process. Um, so then you want to take a look at whatever their step-by-step -step process is. And if they have any supplemental materials, anything outside of the common application uh, for you to submit. So those are, keep those questions in mind for you. I think we're recording this presentation. So uh, you can always refer to the recording a little bit later as well. Um, to work in campus, something simple for international students or easier for US students? Um, it depends on the campus. Um, so at Binghamton University, students, uh, all students, domestic students and international students are eligible to work up to 10 hours per week during the school year and up to 20 hours during break periods. Um, how do students find those jobs and positions? On our campus, students can go through our Fleischmann Center for Career Services. Um, they are uh, proficient in working with international students so they can help you to apply for opportunities on and off campus. If you've never done uh, an interview before, you can practice interviewing with them. If you've never created a resume or cover letter, they'll help you create one. Um, so they will be with you uh, throughout the process of trying to find jobs on campus. Students work in all kinds of jobs on campus. They can be resident advisors in our, in our dormitories. They can uh, work in our cafeterias. They can work in uh, driving buses. We have shuttles. They work in the library. They work in our IT department. So they do all kinds of, they work in offices. They do all kinds of things. Is a job experience something that universities like so much? If yes or not, um, it depends, um, you know, different universe, different programs are recruiting for different things. So if you're applying for like a business uh, administration in a certain college, they might like to see that you've uh, done something with an internship or, or something uh, in advance. I remember at another institution that I was working at, um, we liked to see that students did some kind of shadowing. Um, so it could be a day, it could have been a week, it could be any time, um, particularly if students were looking at uh, physical therapy or occupational therapy, we wanted to see that they had talked to an occupational therapist, at least talked to them to see, you know, if this was something that they really wanted to do and to learn about the opportunities and challenges of being in that role. Um, so, you know, I think it, you don't have to necessarily have a paid job experience, but you know, doing a little bit of research and maybe talking about how you've investigated that future major might be something um, that's helpful to share. Great. Well, um, we have a little bit of time left, so and I will still answer questions, but I do have uh, some information about 
specifically about Binghamton uh, University that I would be delighted to share with you if I, if I may. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead uh, and bring up some specific um, Binghamton University slides for you. So I'll, I'll start off by, well, we're gonna travel to Binghamton University together. So we'll start off with the aerial tour. This is just gonna be three minutes. So I hope you enjoy that. And then I'll go oh, just a, a little bit more info about Binghamton specifically. Thanks for uh, sticking through that those three minutes. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, a little bit about Binghamton. We are located about three hours northwest of New York City in a suburban community also named Binghamton. Uh, so students have access to all the four seasons. Right now we're entering into our fall. Uh, so those beautiful fall colors are gonna start coming out. Actually, they were already started coming out. Um, and so students will have access to our nature preserve on campus, local and state parks, and also our downtown center is just about five miles away from the uh, Binghamton University campus. Here we give you total number of undergraduate students. Uh, we have a little over 2,500 undergraduates, on, rather uh, under, international students on our campus. So over 13,800 undergraduates, and then within that over 2,500 international students. Also graduate students on our campus, uh, we give you total number of applicants here, total, total number of enrolled, uh, first year retention rate. So this is something we are quite proud of because the national average is 73%. The retention rate refers to the number of uh, first year students who come back. They come back for their second year. So that's very high. Uh, so that lets us know that students are feeling supported, that they are feeling they get what they need in order to persist, to exceed. Uh, to grad to succeed and to graduate. 
Uh, we give you some historical information. Uh, so of the students who've been accepted to Binghamton, the middle 50% have between a 93 to 98 out of a 100 point scale or a 3.7 to 3.9 out of a 4.0 scale. Um, so with regard to merit scholarship, what I tell students is if your grades are within these mid ranges or above, then you're going to be competitive. So as I said before, um, we don't have a guaranteed scholarship at any particular number, but this is just here to, to give you that information, let you know um, what, where the competitive range is. Um, and then we also do that with SAT and ACT um, because there are going to be some students who submit, you know, and I do use this slide with, with other students. Um, but as I said before, you don't have to submit the SAT or ACT, you will still be considered for merit-based scholarships. Uh, we have uh, over 130 different majors and minors at Binghamton University. Um, so, and even if you're not sure what you'd like to study, you can still come to Binghamton as an undecided student. Uh, you have until the second semester of your junior year to declare a major and you'll still graduate on time. Uh, so during that time, you can explore uh, things that you're interested in and you'll still be earning credits towards your, de your eventual degree. Uh, within Harper College, uh, that's where our undecided students start because they have the most majors to, to choose from. That's where you'll find history, anthropology, art and design, music, theater, biology, chemistry, environmental studies, environmental sciences. Um, you know, before we go, I will share with you uh, a link to our digi digital brochure so you can see all the, the majors that we have. Uh, we have College of Community and Public Affairs that offers social work and human development. We have a School of Nursing. We have School of Management that offers uh, business administration as well as accounting. We have an engineering school. This offers students uh, biomedical engineering, computer engineering, electrical engineering, industrial and systems, as well as mechanical engineering and then also the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, this is uh, not a program that you can apply to from high school, uh, but once you're admitted to Binghamton, you can apply for a pharmacy early admission program, and that will be a direct entry to the pharmacy school. Uh, also accelerated degree program, so you can earn a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in five years. And we have pre-professional programs for things like health and law. Uh, so I'd be happy to talk to you more about those uh, later on if you want to touch base with me, if you want to email or in touch another way. Students are very active outside of the classroom as well. Over 450 clubs and organizations. Um, we are a division one school. We have 21 NCAA division one teams. Students are very active in lots of clubs, sports, theater, um, music. Um, we also have two fitness centers and rec groups, over 100 classes a week offered on our campus. Uh, so a lot of good things that students are doing outside of the classroom. Just wanted to give you a real quick overview of Binghamton. Um, this QR code is specific to today's event. Um, so if you scan it, you, you're, you can record your attendance at today's event and you can get on a mailing list that's specific for Binghamton University if you like. Uh, this is a picture from our nature preserve. So just right behind the campus, over 180 acres of natural land, 11 miles of hiking, over 200 species of birds live there. It's also home to lots of deer and other wildlife. Um, so it's a beautiful place and that's what it looks like right now. So we're really excited about it. It's definitely our favorite season. Uh, lots of information on our website. So if you want to hear faculty webinars or student life webinars or sign up for our open house that we have coming up in October and November, you can do that on our admissions page. Great content. If you loved that video, there's a lot more videos on our YouTube page, also Instagram and Facebook. This is my personal email address, tbarajas at binghamton.edu. And I do encourage you to email me. I think one of the great myths of college admissions is that uh, admissions counselors are like the gatekeepers, you know, the, uh, for, for getting into college. We want to admit you to, to the university. It's called Office of Admission, not Office of Denial. We want to admit you to the university. So we're your partners. We want to give you all the answers to all the questions that you have. So feel free to, to email us, to contact, to contact us as much as you want. Um, and that includes on WhatsApp. 
Uh, I do answer WhatsApp text messages. So if you want to send me a text, if you're more comfortable communicating that way, that is something that you can do. So I'll let you take a quick photo of that. All right, great. And we have a little bit more time for a few more questions. Are the universities used to have a contact with business around the area, like business around the local area? Um, yeah, we do have uh, partner uh, partnerships with businesses within our, our immediate area, like Binghamton University, but also we have partnerships with um, larger business corporations. So for example, we do have a scholars program called PWC, or which is short for PricewaterhouseCoopers Scholars Program, and they are an accounting firm. Um, so they're one of the big four accounting firms in the United States, and we have a program that's named after them. Uh, we do send a lot of new employees their way. They do love Binghamton University. They recruit a lot on our campus. Uh, so we do have over 1,800 employees who come to our campus every year to meet and recruit students uh, and they come back. So you know, we do have these good relationships with the local community, but also within the, the Northeast, within the region. And that's a good question. And you should definitely ask that question to other uh, schools that you're looking at too. Um, are the students employed before they finish their degree, degree? Is it something common in the US? Sometimes, sometimes a student can receive an offer of employment before um, they graduate, but you really need to work with the career center um, to, to, to apply. You have to apply to those positions. Um, for international students, there's a couple of ways that they, they work. Uh, there's CPT program. This is curricular practical training. Um, they, that's something that they can do while they're, they're in school. And then for certain areas, uh, particularly in the sciences, there's OPT program. This is optional practical training that they can do after they graduate. Um, so our Office for International Students and Scholars, and most campuses have an Office for International Students and Scholars, um, they can work with students on that process, that CBT opt process, and work opportunities for after they graduate. Because uh, most of the time when you're coming to us on an F1 visa, um, or even a J1 visa as a visiting scholar, your time is limited to just your study time. Um, so that is a good question. Let's see, is there information about doctoral programs, especially about urban politics? I was looking for it at the website, but I couldn't find it. I'm not sure if Binghamton has urban politics, but if you email me and I will put my email in here for everybody in the chat, um, I can look that up for you. So you can send an email. And I said I would share our brochure with you and I will. So here is a copy of our brochure. Feel free to take that with you. And if you want to send me any messages on WhatsApp and you have WhatsApp web or computer, you can put that here. Any other questions about merit scholarships or how that relates to common application? No, nope, that's okay. If they pop up in the next couple of minutes, that's all right. Oh, I have one. Okay, great. Sure, no problem. Take as much time as you need. Make sure um, that you save these, any links that we've shared with you, be sure to save them. Um, once we close out of this presentation, um, you won't have these links and, unless you go into the recording. So be sure to copy and paste them onto a different uh, tab or a different page. Do the universities prefer Common App over other platforms? Um, it's 
I reference the common application because it's the most comprehensive. It asks for the most information from students. And as I said before, you want to share as much as you can. So it's a good for platform for sharing as much as you can. Um, in addition to those areas that I talked about, it's also going to ask you personal information, you know, your name, um, your, like, your age, where you live, um, your parents' information, you know, if you have siblings who are also going to school, things like that. Um, Binghamton University accepts the coalition application as well, um, which it functions the same way that Common App does in that it's a, it's a member, uh, it's a member organization. So a lot of colleges and, and universities use it. Um, so if most of the schools on your list use Coalition App and not Common App, then it's probably beneficial for you to, to use Coalition instead, because that will be more convenient for you. Um, we also have the SUNY application. Um, so uh, most international students don't use SUNY application because they're applying to SUNY being State University of New York. Um, so they're applying to more than just State University of New York schools, but we do have some applicants who only apply to State University of New York schools. They tend to be students who live here in New York and want to stay in New York. Um, so it really just depends on your list of schools that you're applying to, the applications they accept, and which one is going to be more convenient for you. But neither one is going to give you more of an edge. I think we like common application because it asks a lot of questions. It's the most comprehensive and we want to learn as much about you as we can. Um, are international students eligible for non-need-based aid? I'm afraid not. So at, at Binghamton, uh, we only have merit scholarships uh, for, for international students. But you can check uh, maybe check with Education USA. I think we have maybe two minutes left. So I'm going to throw it over to Victoria if you want to talk a little bit about Education USA and programs that you have coming up. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I'm going to talk in Portuguese now. Um, nós temos, bom, a gente vai ter o LLM Webinar Series, que é um uma série de webinars é, para o mestrado em Direito nos Estados Unidos. Não sei se vocês conhecem alguém que estariam interessados ou se vocês é, são alunos de Direito buscando é, o próximo passo, né? estão na graduação, querem fazer o mestrado. É, como, eu, como eu falei no início, a gente tem o Plantão Education USA, que é uma oportunidade ótima para vocês. Então, por exemplo, sobre essa questão de, de bolsas por necessidade ou bolsas, bolsas por mérito, perguntas específicas vocês podem entrar no plantão é, e fazer a pergunta direta que vocês querem. A gente tem praticamente todos os dias. Então, entrando no nosso site educationusa.org.br barra agenda, vocês conseguem ver todos esses eventos. Um, if anyone has any questions, se alguém ainda tem alguma pergunta, or is still here... <laughs> Well, thank you, Victoria, and thank you, everybody who joined in the session today. Uh, stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to reading your application. Take care. Thank you, Bye -bye. everyone. Um, if you want, just reach out to Education USA, to Tanya, and we're here to help. Bye-bye.